Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership singer, bassist, composer, and producer, Joyce Fenderella Irby, best wow. known as a core member of Climax, the successful and trailblazing all-female funk, R&B, and pop band. The group notched seven top 20 R&B hits between 1984 and 1990 that included the dance floor jams, the men all pause, and meeting in the ladies' room, and the ballads, I Miss You and I'd Still Say Yes. Launching her solo career in 1989, she scored the hit Mr. DJ, featuring rapper Dougie Fresh. In 2022, she released her acclaimed autobiography, I'd Still Say Yes, subtitled The Dreamer's Account of Surviving the Entertainment Business. She continues to perform as Climax with Joyce Fenderella Irby and is recording new music with the Femme Mafia. Joyce, thanks for joining me. How are you? Hey, God, that's quite an introduction. I, I appreciate that. I'm going to use some of that. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. So glad you could join the show. And where are you today? I am in VA in Atlanta. All right. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm not far away here in Charlotte. So. Okay. Well, you know, I grew up on Fort Bragg, um, which is now Fort Liberty. Grew up on Post, right down the street. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, you know, I've been a fan for so long. Um, I don't know how much you know about me, but, you know, around the time when Climax was peaking, you know, I was in full full throttle as a disc jockey in clubs and mobile. And so, I mean, those tracks were just key. You know, people loved them. So, and I had all the 12-inch singles, of course, you know, the long versions. And, yeah, so That's great to cool, have you. I, I just had no idea people would still want to hear that music. So I'm just so happy about it. You should be, you should be. So let's go back a little bit and then work our way up, if that's cool. Okay. Um, you're from Orlando, right? And you moved to Los Angeles. Yes. Yes. And um, what first drew you to music, Joyce? I was just born with it. Um, the first music, the first songs that really affected me were like songs by the Beatles, you know, uh, when I was in elementary school. The Beatles started it, and then Stevie Wonder when he was a kid, and then when Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five came out, I lost my mind. Um, and the Supremes, but just early, early it was the Beatles. It was the Beatles, and they made me want to make up songs. I was like, it's just some, you know. Well, they are who they are, but that's how the the, the early part of it started. The interest in it. And what gave you confirmation that you had the talent and ability to pursue it? When George Clinton thought I was cool as a 16-year-old, I was like, okay, he thinks I'm cool. The coolest man in the world thinks I'm cool and hangs out with me, so I'm going to be fine one way or the other. That was literally it, just me standing with my bass 
uh, my father bought me a, a Fender Jazz bass, and I would stand on the loading docks of concerts when it was Earth, Wind, and Fire, the Ohio Players, uh, the Solar Galaxy of Stars, but mostly earliest, it was when George Clinton came to town. And I would just stand there, no case, no amplifier, you couldn't hear anything, but I would just be sitting there. And after a while, he'd just be like, you know, he'd be waving me in. And after his shows, and this was like in the Southeast, in North and South Carolina, uh, and uh, some Virginia, and maybe uh, Alabama once, but, and and yeah, I said Virginia. And he started letting me come to his room with him for about 10 minutes after the shows. And he would sit and just listen to me play. It was quiet. And then most of the guys like Gary Scheider and all of them would be lined up outside yelling and screaming because they wanted to start partying. And I didn't, first I thought they wanted to come in and did they want to come in and jam with us? And George would just be laughing. But he would listen to me play and then he'd say, you're going to be great. You are great. You just, you know, have a be drive home safely, but you're going to be great. And that was that just got to be our routine uh, when I was a teenager, started when I was 16. And that's just really, and he started introducing me to people like as his next star and all these things. And it just, it just made me really feel like if that dude thinks I'm cool, then I'm going to be okay, literally. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to a lot of those same shows around that time because I came up, you know, same time, uh, late 70s, mid 70s. Yeah. And, uh, man, just was... we were so lucky to have those bands. Yeah, and like Earth, Wind and Fire was like church and a magic show because I had never seen, I mean, of course, I was young. I hadn't seen much, but I, like the way they would be here, then they'd disappear and they'd be all, just all of this stuff. And then the way their music was uplifting I was like really imprinted with the quality of entertainment watching a lot of these artists. So were you inspired by people, you know, as far as bass goes, like Verdine or Larry Graham or Bootsy? My top three were Lewis Johnson, who I met. He made me a practice tape. Larry Graham, who I met. I don't have a practice tape, but he sat and we played. Um, a guy named Wizard, who played bass with Mother's Finest, taught me how to do an upstroke where I'd slap the string down with my thumb and then pop it back with the top of my thumb, which was not very comfortable. But I didn't know how he got that sound. And Verdine on stage was the epitome of an active bass player. And then Bootsy with the Mutron. Um, and I interviewed him for my school paper like many, many years ago. Um, taught me that you could have effects on a bass and it could be something different. So you named, you know, everybody that I was excited about except for Lewis. So yeah, I was into all of those guys so much. Well, you picked it, some challenges because those guys just unbelievable, especially with how physical their playing was. Yeah. And I don't like when I was younger, I was really, really good. I'm nowhere near as good at playing right now and there are kids that can play me under the table and i'm fine with it because i had my time even though i still want to practice a little more but realizing you know like as you age and having a little bit of arthur and itis and a thumb or a finger it's like oh i used to take all that for granted just being able to move so fluidly i'm like oh it changes you know i can still do it but i was really just so fortunate and so blessed and also, here's one thing, as a young woman, like 16, 18, 20, whatever, the guys knew I wanted, I was serious about playing bass. So they, it, we were like musicians. And so it was just tripping me out that they were just sitting with me, talking to me. And, you know, I got a bass, you got a bass. And that was like, I just felt like a million dollars, even though nobody knew me, except they'd be like, oh, that young lady's outside with her bass, you know, um, but I, I was so blessed just to interact with all those guys. Did it ever become a possibility that you might play with George Clinton? Yes, actually, um, I forgot to provide. We have some old pictures in the studio uh, together. When By the time I joined Climax, well, let's say I was one of George's artists and he was introducing me. He said he's going to do me and somebody like uh like he had the brides of Frankenstein 
and he was going to have me and or like Bootsy and Bootsy's rubber band. But before it was taking like a long time, it was just taking a long time for that to happen. So uh, he came to the studio in, in Richmond, Virginia with me where I was recording this song called The Wild, Wild and Crazy Song, imitating him because I was like a I was a female MC who played bass. I wasn't really like singing much. I was playing bass. And I um, drove to Florida and took the song to this company, TK Records in Miami. And they like put the record out. And George was still busy doing all kinds of things. He's like, yeah, you know, do whatever, you know, we're going to be good. And so um, it charted uh, on a national chart in November of 1980. On Cashbox, there was Cashbox, you know, Record World and Billboard. Those were the three. And now I'm on a mission to see if there's any other female MC who was a solo artist who had a song on a national chart. I can't find one. And if you can't find one, that would make me the first one, which is almost unbelievable. But even the New York DJs that I know, they're like, well, if you're not first, you're second for sure. But there's got to be somebody else, but we can't find her. So I don't know. How funny is that? Um, yeah. Well, it's... I mean, you can make that claim for now until it's disproved. Yeah, I think I might do a, pay, a post and offer to pay somebody who can prove that I'm not the first. Um, yeah, that'll get something going. That's but cool. so... George was busy. And also in the, another meantime, I didn't sign the contract with TK or they want me to sign a contract that said you make no money. And I thought, I'm not doing that. So Frankie Crocker went on the record and then they pulled it four weeks later because we didn't have an agreement. And then I got a call from Leon Silvers, who had seen me, uh, actually Dick Griffey, the founder of Solar Records, told Leon to get my information as I'm standing on the loading dock. All of this is for me standing on the loading dock at the artist entrance playing my bass. And Leon got my number and he said, uh, we have a situation. We're going to, you know, give you a call and maybe fly you out to LA. And I'm thinking, okay, right. And then a couple of months later, that that's what happened because they signed Bernadette started the group climax. They had a bass player that couldn't play. And they had two members they were replacing before they released their first record. And then I was like, oh, they really called me. And so then I was in California. That was funny. <laughs> wow. What, what was your uh, first impression of uh, both Dick Griffey and, and Leon? I could tell Dick Griffey was the boss by the way he walked. <laughs> Slow, methodical, cool, just looking around, sort of nodding his head at everything. And then people kept running up to him, you know, Mr. Griffey, Mr. Griffey, Mr. Griffey. And um, I and Leon, I was a fan of his work anyway, because I loved Shalimar. It was like one of my favorite groups. And I studied, you know, I played bass to the songs that, that he wrote. And so I used to practice them. And um, they were just cool people. They were just really, and I met Howard, who had always been one of my favorite singers. And from the time I was like, because we're, we're about the same age. He's like one year older than me. So he was like maybe barely 20 or something. But he was always the same sweet person. Always. And he's the same today. But he was always nice. He would take pictures with everybody. All of that kind of stuff. And um, I just ended up out there with a bunch of crazy girls. What were your first impressions of the girls in the group? <laughs> Well, Bernadette picked me up at the airport in a little convertible MG, and she was funny. Like, I stayed with her the first couple of weeks. Um, I thought, California, the air is kind of, like, I'd heard of smog. I'd never seen it. I was excited to be there. I was like, people live on these hills. Are their houses going to fall down? And the weather's really nice. And, okay, I just got to meet everybody. Um, so Bernadette is the same. <laughs> She's the same person. Witty, funny, all over the place. Uh, passionate about creating music. Um, I met 
Lynn Malsby, the piano player, she was serious about playing pianos. And at that point, like at rehearsal, she had a big Yamaha electric piano, but it was gigantic. And it, it would take a couple of us to like move it around and set up. Um, Lorena, who was the lead singer, is the lead singer. Um, she was cool. She had a really big family and they used to invite me down. I lived with them for a while too, before I got it together. And, uh, there were a couple other, there was Judy, who was a percussionist who ended up leaving the group and Cheryl Cooley, the guitar player that we're at odds with now for trying to steal the name. That's for later. And we had auditions for another keyboard player and um, a percussionist. So Robin Greider ended up being the keyboard player. And the first percussionist that we had come to the studio was Sheila E. How funny is that? Because she hadn't, um, her and Prince hadn't kicked off their thing yet. So we were at Larrabee Studios on um, in West Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard. And she came down and it was cool. We all talked. She politely declined. And right after that, do, 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 do. I was like, hey, girl, you made the right choice for yourself. But it's just really interesting how we were all you know, like potentially in the same group. Mm. How, how, would you how would you describe the initial like playing together chemistry when you first started doing? It, it was cool. It was cool because I'd always, of course, played with guys. And that was always cool. And there's, you know, there's different dynamics, sometimes for men and for women, but for musicians, if you can just be musicians, it's really all the same. Um, the one thing I notice with women, or at least with us, is you want to be sure. Well, Lynn Malsby says it best. Lynn says women are groomed to be pitted against each other to compete for men and resources and all these other things. And, and boys, when they're growing up, are taught uh, sports, being collective you know, all together, let's all work together. It's different now, but at that time, it was the way we were brought up was sort of separate. And so I guess a lot of times we ran into problems of just trying to make sure we're not trying to show up another one or just be conscious of another person's feelings. Because it's it, we were more sensitive as women and like we really lost we wasted a lot of time and lost a lot of ground with stuff that just, you know, it was just like a waste of just being in our feelings, as the kids say, yeah. you know, and we, we all have them. But working with guys, it's like like guys can hate each other. We're going to work together. We're going to get this check. I'll see you next week. I'm out. And we needed to be more like that. And unfortunately, we weren't. The guys, I think, are a little better at carp um, compartmentalizing like that. Yeah. Yes, we're going to keep yeah. this over here. And yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I know I am. Yeah. Um, and that's not like my wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, just so you know, I mean, I was, you know, with the group from the get go. So, you know, the first record, Never Underestimate the Powerful Woman, that title track was slamming, you know? And uh, so I felt you guys were fire out of the gate. That is really cool. I, um, and the thing about that record, because they had a base, because they had that album was done by the time I got there. Mm. And I talk about that in my book because people are like, oh, I love the way you played so and so on that first album. I'm like, I'd like to take credit, but it was not me because they had a bass player who couldn't play. So I guess they used um, either, you know, some of the guys that Leon worked with or one of the guys from Lakeside to do the bass parts on the first album because I, I wasn't there. And this is the kicker. They said, they sent me the music and told, told me to learn the songs, but they said we got rid of our bass player because she couldn't play. And when I heard the music, I was like, oh, my God, if this is not being able to play, I was like, I can't play it any better than the way they recorded it. And when I got there, they were like, no, that wasn't her. That was somebody else we had play on the first album. Because <laughs> I was like, I think her playing is, is perfect. Why would mm -hmm. she want to replace her? But it wasn't her. So, so they like Millie okay. Vanilli did for for the bass on that first one. Yeah. Um, well, girls will be girls in. That was your first. Yep, the girls will be girls album. Um, and there were a couple of things still. I can't 
I'd have to go like look at all the stuff that's on there. Um, but there were some like guitar parts and some bass parts that they had like some of their, because we still weren't producing, even though Jimmy and Terry let me and Bernadette, I guess, co-produce one song with them. So they'd have some of their people play and then we'd play too. So some of it was still mixed. Um, and then when we got to, you know, the next one, it was, you know, we were handling it all. I got to um, just say one thing about that second record though. Uh, did you play on Wild Girls by chance? Yeah, I did. Okay, that's a great funky jam right there. Um, and you know what about Wild Girls, Scott? If you listen to the formation of Wild Girls, that's the exact, that's every Janet Jackson up-tempo song that Jimmy and Terry did. It has the foundation for all of that Janet Jackson stuff started with Jimmy and Terry working with us in the studio doing those records. It was their formula, but we got a chance to experience it first because, you know, they got kicked out of the time for working with us. Yeah, that was a pretty fortuitous thing for them as it turned out, but um, yes. who knew at the time? Um, I have a, a friend in the UK. He's like the most avid record collector I've ever met. He trades records. He also plays bass, and you're one of his heroes. So uh, his name's Martin, and I wanted to uh, just uh, Martin. say that especially um, Girls Will Be Girls. Um, did you play on that title track? Uh, I played part. <laughs> yes and uh, somebody else played too i can't remember who it was I, yeah i don't want to lie i can't remember who else was on there i asked because uh, in particular he uh, loves that track and inspired him to play bass and he recommends it for any bass player well that's really cool either yeah. way it got him going yeah. hi martin <laughs> All right. So um, how did uh, Jimmy and Terry um, inspire you to sing or, or help you cultivate that? Yeah, they were like, she needs to sing. <laughs> Basically, like when it's funny, working with Jimmy and Terry helped us all be more collaborative. And they were like, whatever you guys can do, we want you to do it. If you can't do it, we'll do it. But you can really do all your own stuff. That was their thing. They were like, we want you to sound like you. We want to enhance what you sound like, but we really want you guys to do it. So they were like the best to work with because they, they helped us grow and they stretched us. They helped us cooperate. And one of the biggest things was like Jimmy would be in another room playing the piano a lot. And when I'd be singing certain parts at some point, he and, and he and Terry both, but Jimmy specifically was like, you need to be leading more songs. He says, your voice, you need to be leading more songs. It's unique. And I was like, well, okay. I hope so at some point. Um, but, you know, my job was like the bass player. And, but then being around, I think I sang like one song or maybe a song and a half, but, you know, before them, but they were like, no, no, she, she needs to sing. And that made it cool. That just gave me an open pathway and made it cool so that we could share. And Lorena didn't mind. And there were some songs that just fit me better. So, yeah, they are the reason that I got a chance to do some leads, like really do some leads. Well, another great reason that they're smart guys, and <laughs> some of the best producers, obviously, ever. But um, yes, did you um, reference any other singers in what you brought to singing? Okay, my long history of... This is weird because I don't sound anything like him. I used to listen to Ronald Isley sing certain things to figure out how to use my voice to breath ratio. Because when I speak, sometimes I sound like a cartoon character because I don't use enough breath. But when I sing, I use the my, well, my like 60-40 ratio. And when he would sing songs like, you know, For the Love, living for the love of you and make me say it again girl he would go like in between his natural and his false 
So I would practice singing along with him and then I'd just cut it off and I'd sing into a tape recorder and then play it back for myself so I could see if I used enough breath. I was like, oh, it sounds way better like this. And then, of course, when the Jackson 5 came out, the, the range Michael sang in was a perfect range for me. And we can get more into that when we get to I Miss You. But um, yeah, I, it's weird. I don't think I've ever told anybody. I used to sing along with Ron Isley a lot. And then I would sing, of course, all the Jackson 5 stuff. You know, when I was a kid, Michael and I are like two years difference in age. Uh, and it was in my range. It was high enough. And Stevie. I would sing along with Stevie, too. Now, were you able to uh, accompany yourself on bass while you sang, or did you do those separately? It was hard, but sometimes I did it together. But if I'm singing a totally different rhythm, it's almost impossible for me. I never could get all of that synced. I'd end up hitting the downbeat, like, right, but stuff in between. If I'm singing a different pattern, I was like, I can't. It was, it was easier if I was doing keyboard bass, but still, it still was now. Yeah, I'm not so, good at that. It's a, it's a tall order for sure. So being in the ladies' room. Yeah. What can you tell us about the making of that? You know, what was the vibe like in the studio? Because you guys obviously elevated a completely different level. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what went into that? It started with um, Mr. Griffey allowing me to, he gave me a producer contract. Because I was like, hey, I... I'm a producer. I need a contract. And he was like, okay, this child is driving me nuts. But eventually I wore him down and he gave me a producer contract and he had me produce a couple of songs on his wife, Carrie Lucas. And I did, I brought him the track for the men all pause. I'm like, we need to do, I said, look, I produced my own record. I was on the chart before I got here, you know, trying to muster George Clinton thinks I'm cool. I'm like, seriously, dude. So um, he heard the track for the men all pause. And I got my contract. And he was like, okay, so, you know, I might have other people, other producers come in, but, you know, you're official now. And, you know, you can oversee the stuff. You guys are originals and keep doing stuff like this right here. So um, I did the track for the mental pause. I was looking to do like a Rick James track, like you and I. I wanted something to hit hard. So I was like, okay. So, you know, there was do, 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 do. I was like, okay, this will work. I gave the track to Bernadette and she did her thing. She's an incredible lyricist. And her personality within itself just takes over all of it. So she wrote great melody and lyrics. I was like, I got my producer contract, so we don't need any supervision over here. He's like, okay, go ahead, go, go do it, go do it. And then, but except for Steve Shockley came in and hyped the drums up a little bit. Um, and I think Byrne and I are listed as co-producers on the song. That's fine. But it was a great record. Then he had signed Midnight Star. And he assigned them to do two songs on us. So they did a version of Meeting in the Ladies Room. And I heard it and I was like, there needs to be some other stuff in that melody. So Dick took the original track and let me go into the studio for a day to change some stuff I wanted to change on it. So there's a part in the song that's like, uh, well, I'm doing all the answers. You better watch your man. All this kind of stuff. But then there's a part that's saying, oh, 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 oh. Mm, everybody sing it like saying, oh, oh. That wasn't even in the song. I was like, we need these. The oh, oh was an ad lib at the in the fade. And I'm like, that's a whole section. So I created that little section like that, and they changed the drums to sound like the menopause pause drums. And that's how we got meeting in the ladies' room, which is an incredible record uh, from the guys in Midnight Star. And I credit Mr. Griffey for having, for trusting me to add something to it that I heard that made it better, and it definitely made it better. Or people wouldn't be saying, uh oh, uh oh, oh, none of that. Mm -hmm. So, and then Lynn came up with a great song, I Miss You. He's like, okay, go on and do that. So we were just rolling. We were just rolling. And uh, George 
And Bernadette and I have a different story about this, but we pulled George Clinton into doing Sexy With Us, which is a song that Bernadette wrote. And that was fun. Um, and she did Divas Need Love Too with uh, Vincent and Rick, who did uh, who were produ who were producing hits on New Edition at the time. Uh, I think Count Me Out and Cool It Now, because um, they were her and Vincent were good were good friends. But it was it was the first album we got to really be in charge of, you know, for the most part. It was cool. Yeah, it felt really good too. Like, oh, finally, yes. How did you feel when um, the mental pause blew up before meeting, right? That was our first single, the mental yeah. pause. Yep. Yeah. So when that blew up, I mean, how did it feel and uh, how did it change your life or did it not really change your life? It finally validated everything I thought about myself. Like I can write and produce good records and we're, a, you know, we're a band with something to offer and people like us. And we're different and unique because there's still, you know, aside from the Go-Go's and the Bangles, there weren't any urban girl bands. There weren't any girl bands, period. And there still hasn't been one like us, which trips me out because so many more women now are playing instruments. But it just felt, it, you know, it's, it's the best feeling. It's just the best feeling to be somewhere and turn on the radio and hear your music because I was just used to hearing it in my room. Or on my cassette player, or you know, in my car when I had a cassette player, I'd put my own music in there. And to hear it and have people like it and sing along with it, it's just the most beautiful thing. And no matter what, I'm so grateful for all of it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you had monster hits on the dance floor, but then you had the ballad hit, which showed the breadth of you guys. So, I mean, that really That's, showed that you could do anything. That was such a surprise um, when we mastered I Miss You, the guy at Capitol Records told me and Bernard that we can't master this because the bass is too loud. You know, I just got the bass up anyway. And the bass is too loud and the frequency is too wide and we can't do so-and-so. So me and Bernadette went to have a meeting with Mr. Griffey. He said, I don't care what he says. Don't change it. Do it just like that. And, <laughs> okay. Wow. I didn't expect that record to be anything like what it was it's amazing it's amazing yeah a big time crossover hit and everything yep yep that made us pop where we were making i think like five thousand dollars a show and then we went to fifteen thousand over the next week when i miss you was out i was like oh okay <laughs> yeah that was something who, who were your big tours at that time who were you on the bill with? Um, the Planetary Invasion Tour, which was Midnight Star, Shalimar, and Us. And then, I guess the album after that, we started touring with Cool in the Gang, which is great because they have such a big pop audience. We did lots of things. We also, we did the Gap Band. We did a tour with them. But... Um, there's a lot of stuff I don't remember. We did a lot of spot dates, but the big, the, the tours, Planetary Invasion Tour, um, tour with the Gap Band, and we did a couple with Cool and the Gang, which were cool. And then we would have these water pistol fights, which got us in a lot of trouble. That was like my idea, because I like toys, and I would go to the toy store in whatever city we are, and I'd get these water pistols that look like machine guns, machine gun water pistols. Back then, it was okay, because people weren't shooting each other like they are now. And so... Um, we had a rule between the bands, like you can't uh, shoot anybody in their show clothes. Okay. And this is when JT was still the lead singer of Cool in the Gang. And we were, two things happened. We were in Miami and we'd stand outside the elevators and like wait to ambush each other. And then JT opened the elevator with a shower cap on and came out and was spraying all of us. And some older people at the hotel were getting nervous and they ended up calling the SWAT team and they told us to stop it and we stopped it. Because we didn't realize it was like, you know, we were like 20s, early 30s. We were just being ridiculous. 
but it was you know bothering some of the older guests in some of the hotels so we were like okay sorry we're not we you know we don't we're like what's that big truck rolling up outside in front of the hotel ah <sighs> but it was fun it was fun uh jt took it seriously <laughs> with his shower cap <laughs> <laughs> yes that was really it was really cool though did you feel like um those shows at least initially were like a really good vindication because maybe you still had some, some, some skeptics and, and then they see you guys and they're like, wow, they really can play. Oh, all the time. And Jimmy and Terry will testify to that more than anything. They were like, oh, they can play for real. They can play. <laughs> and anytime people saw us, it was like, wow. Even when, you know, we had our drum machine because it's 5,000 drum tracks and you can't play 5,000 drum tracks. But that was it. Everything else, like, yeah, it was all live and people loved it. And now they just love to hear it. They don't care if it's live or not, but they're like, well, they, they did play it at one time. It's just, we got respect of other guys that were musicians instantly. It was like, okay, it was instantly cool with them. Hmm. Oh, and yeah. Ready for the World. We toured with them a lot too. I forgot. Sorry. Gotcha. Yes. That makes sense. Um, yeah, me and the ladies room, I just got to also mention lock and key. That was a good funky track. It didn't go, <laughs> as, you know, yeah, I think burn did that one with Jimmy and Terry. You mentioned already, um, divas need love too. To me, that always seemed, uh, for me, it seems sort of like, um, the female response to gigolos get lonely too, by the time. Yes. Yes. By, yeah. By Morris day and burn a day. <laughs> that's what we call her sometimes yeah um absolutely and women love that record even though it wasn't like a big big hit but we always like if bird's doing a show or i'm doing one that we always include uh divas need love too because women love it and sexy that was a jam i like that one yes yes and sexy is a good song for breaks and accents dun, 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 dun. yeah yeah, sexy was fun. Um, yeah, and Bernadette's funny with her lyrics. Like, she's just funny. <laughs> she's just very creative. Yeah, well, she um, definitely brought the attitude, you know? She brought the attitude, and it was different. It wasn't anybody else's attitude. It was hers. And that's one of the things that made us collectively unique. It's like you have her with her sense of fashion and style and it's all about me then you had you know Lorena with her sort of power vocals then you had me and I could be you know make you cry you know with some of the ballads or you know try to knock you out of your seat with some of my tracks like the men all pause we were a combination of so many different type things that just all went well together and that was cool. Now, did that massive success um, bring more pressure to like kind of match it again? Um, well, I never looked at our success as massive. We had success and I felt like we were one really good album away from going over into like another level, which we didn't get to do. But it certainly brought pressure to at least, you know, do something uh, as good as the last thing that we did, and then maybe stretch it a little bit more. Uh, and we were all growing. I was like sort of going a little more back toward like hip hop a little. And Vern was sort of like Bernadette would be good to have like a Broadway show. She does things that are really very esoteric. And so we were both starting to create a little bit, I guess, a little bit more broadly uh, after that. And I think that's when we were imploding anyway, because Bernadette wanted to be a solo artist. So uh, Sylvia Roan, she had her group Madam X. And I know that Sylvia basically offered her a solo deal. Um, it would have been good if she had taken that and stayed with the group, which was the plan for my solo deal with Motown, because it's all it was all universal. And so 
after the album with I'd Still Say Yes and Divas Need Love Too and Sexy and those songs, that's when they kicked me out um, for taking the solo deal with Motown. But the plan was for me to do that and still stay in the group. And the other girls were just upset and they were like, no. So I was like, ah, oh, okay. Anyway. Mm. So how did how did you process that? Um, I never wanted to be a solo artist. I always wanted to be a part of a group. I enjoy pumping up other people, which is how I started signing other songwriters and producers and other artists. I like pumping people up. So it was just devastating. I couldn't understand it. I did not understand it. And um, I mean, I understand it now. It's just hating. But I was like, this is a terrible business decision. This makes no sense. This is an awful business decision. I'm like, Bernadette already left. And I just, it's just, I, uh, it was, it was just, yeah. I, I still, I'm still like, what a horrible business decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you picked yourself up uh, and you did your solo record. And um, what do you remember about that experience? I remember that's when I signed um, Dallas Austin, who was a 16 or 17 year old who had good hip hop beats. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do some hip hop. I said, I need a song that has like swing horns and things like ba da 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 ba da 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 da. Like, want something kind of jazzy, but it's like hip hop. And so he gave me a track. He was putting something together. I was like, okay, let's flip this and this and that. And then I was like, this is too hype for me to sing. I'm going to ruin it. So I have to go find a rapper to put on it and let him start the song. And then I'm gonna come in and sing the hooks. And on a remix, I'll do a little rapping, but I want to feature a rapper. And so, of course, I thought of Dougie Fresh because he's, you know, clean, fun, whatever. And that was actually the first record. It became a style where the guest rapper starts out as the main artist on the verses. And then the singer comes in and does the hooks. That became a style after that. Because before... It's heavy D and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. They come in on a bridge and they do that. And that's it. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is too hype. You have to do this. Um. So, yeah. And then that just blew up. People loved the record like crazy. And um, I, I was glad I got a chance to do some hip hop. I had a ballad called I'll Be There which really was supposed to be a climax song. But since I was kicked out, I just was like, I'll just use it for myself. Um, and I liked it, but I still felt like I was supposed to be in a female band. You know, and then there was a whole bunch of business crap that happened um, that just made it impossible for me to even continue you know, like that, just a horrible, horrible mess of stuff. Like um, being in entertainment is one of the easiest legal ways to make a whole ton of money all of a sudden, like out of nowhere. And if you show that you can generate that or you have a assets that generate that, then other people are certainly going to come in to try to take whatever they can. So after I signed Dallas, and we did the Mr. DJ record. Uh, Motown was like, um, we, we have this group called Boys to Men. We want you guys to come and work on. Okay, so Dallas started working on the Motown Philly track, and I was supposed to be doing some ballads. And make a long story short, let me see, Clarence Avant, Joel Katz, Michael Bivens, and Gerald Busby, um, got together and decided to pretty much eliminate me, the person that Dallas was signed to as a songwriter and producer, to have him just do a bunch of stuff that they wanted him to do. And um, oh, I can't forget my friend L.A. Reid. Um, 
And they just did what they could to just pretty much wipe me off the face of the earth so that they would be unimpeded to do whatever. So there was lawsuits. And then I, you know, I sued everybody. and We settled, uh, but it was just a big mess. So it just gave me a different perspective on music and, you know, just just the nastiness, the ratchet nature of people. I do music because I love it. I never did it for money. I just love it. And I love facilitating other people. I was not aware of the other part of it. Like, and I, I just learned some very painful lessons. Uh, you cut know, through, but cut, cut through sharks. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, but I'm here. I have my voice. I started working with kids after that. Um, with uh, Lloyd, who was 11 or 12, who now is doing really good on his own. And uh, another kid I saw on Showtime at the Apollo, Sammy. And I had, he did a song called I Like It that Dallas produced, ultimately. That was like a number one record when he was 13. Um, and it was, that experience still with them was fun. And having seen Lloyd grow up and taking him from label to label from 12 to 18 to finally to get a hit. I was like, who I live to see it. Okay. Okay. So uh, I tell people now I'm retired. I'm just working for myself. I'm writing for myself. I'm going to sing while I still have my voice and I'm just grateful. What a great mentor, you know, they're so lucky. Um, and you can also tell them about the pitfalls, you know, that they need to stay away from. Yeah. But you know, one thing, you can tell people all you want until they fall in that hole. It's not really real, but I can at least, you know, give them some warnings. They, you know, they did get the chance to learn a lot of things. And I even got, cause Dallas and I hadn't talked for many years. He actually sent me an email about a month ago and just said, thank you for everything. So I was like, okay, that's nice. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You just never know. Did you get any chance to perform any of the material you did for your solo record? Just for a moment. We did uh, Chicago. There was like a promo tour. And then, wait, they asked me to be on Showtime at the Apollo, one of my favorite so uh, shows. And I was so sensitive at that time. I told, I told them I didn't want to do it because I thought they would boo me. Somebody was like, Joyce, they only boo the contestants. They don't boo the guests. I'm like, but you don't know the crowd. They just, they could have a bad day. They just might not like me. That's the one thing I really regret not doing. So I'd still say yes. What inspired you and uh, what was your process like going through that? Because I got to oh. tell you, Joyce, 90% maybe of the people I have on this show and I talk to from, you know, the industry, they say they're going to write a book but hardly anyone actually goes through with it because it takes so much work. It takes so much work. I was fortunate. I was cleaning up one day and I have all these diaries. I mean, I can tell you, I would write down everything in some days. I'm missing one crazy year. I'm missing a lot of 1986. But from when I was in middle school, up until about 2000 almost, I kept real um, serious records um, of things. And when I opened it up, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I wrote all this down. Some of the specifics that I wasn't sure of, I could go and I'd find it. And I used to keep these tablets that I'd keep notes on when we were in the studio, including how much things cost and how much time and blah, blah. I have so much documentation. It's like I'm an expert witness for myself. Hmm. And I needed to just vent about a lot of things, uh, a lot of misconceptions people have. And I really thought, if I can expose the things that are painful and embarrassing for me, it's going to help somebody who thinks, oh, she just got it easy. None of us have it easy. We all have stories. But sharing, being willing to be vulnerable enough to expose yourself that helps other people and i was like i'm just gonna you know say almost every horrible thing and every beautiful thing because it's there's beauty 
in all of it as well. And I just was like, this will help somebody. And it was sort of like um, therapy for me. And then remembering, I was like, I'm going to go punch that dude in the face right now. I forgot about that. But it was also so many acts of kindness, like I just random things like driving down by the Hollywood Bowl and Benny Medina pulling up next to me. He's like, Joyce, I haven't seen you in a long time. I said, I know, but he said, you look great. I said, thank you, Benny. See, and he, and then he just, you know, flew off and just random things uh, like Sylvia Roan. Um, they wanted her to speak at a convention and she was like, uh, I'm not available, but Joyce Irby can take my place. I'm like, I can take your place speaking like things that I forgot about that meant a lot to me. So I got to relive all of those. And I'm like, there's stuff in here that other people can relate to. There really is. Well, congratulations on doing it and doing it at the level you've done it. I mean, it's, I think, a five-star review on Amazon. So people are, love yes. it. Yeah. I just got to get people to look at it. It's like four point nine i think but that's like five to me that's amazing it's who yeah we all got stories mm. i was so fortunate that you kept records like that that's terrific yes i could use like i could be used like in a, in a legal case for documenting certain things because i literally wrote it down at that time that's amazing and you've been uh making some new music you know i see your posts and uh Looks like you've been on a little bit of a Latin kind of kick lately. I have been. So today, uh, the salsa mix of I Miss You, which is just fabulous. Um, I'm excited about like real bands. Like I, I like big band stuff too. And so um, a bunch of musicians in Venezuela, like 95 percussionists, it seems like with all the tracks that there were and like horn sections and I just love it. It's just, it's freeing. It's like, okay, real music again. I do a lot of, you know, synthetic stuff myself too, but the opportunity to, a guy named uh, Tori Antonio Crow contacted me and said it was his dream for me to do a salsa version of I Miss You. I was like, okay. I'm just like, okay, we can do that. And he, you know, put the musicians and the people together in a, there's a jazz and Latin pianist. His name is Joel. I think it's Uriola. I'm not sure. It might, I'm going to get it. By the time I do another interview, I'm going to have his name right. Because he did like the arrangements of some of the stuff. It's incredible. And I'm so grateful. I'm grateful. And I'm doing a bunch of other stuff, too. I'm going to start releasing stuff every four to six weeks that I've been recording for five years and never releasing. So I'm like, okay, Joyce, just get it out. Get it out. So, yeah. Do you anticipate uh, an album or EP at some point or just uh, single releases? Well, I have enough for, I was going to do a, a singing album and then a, what I call musical poetry, which is me talking. I can't say rapping because that's for kids. Um, but I've learned that putting everything out at one time, you lose advantages over what the distributors give you advantages to take. So that's why I'm just doing one thing every 30 to 45 days. Um, I've got, you know, about six things that are finished. They're just like in line. And Bernadette and I are doing a song called Just Love Me as well. That's a really good record that she wrote uh, probably in two months. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Uh, good to have you back together again for sure. Yes. Yes. And we actually... Bernadette, Lorena, Lynn, Robin, and me, the five of us, have been considering doing an album, but that came about because one of our original members, Cheryl Cooley, who I refer to as hashtag thirsty, keeps trying to copyright the name Climax just for her exclusive use. And recently, the trademark commission approved her application and she had to, you know, you have to publish it for opposition for 30 days. So of course we all got together and we got an attorney who, and so we're opposing it, but it's all so ridiculous to me and people like I'll get mail, well, electronic mail or comments from people who are like, they advertise the climax show. And I don't know who was singing I Miss You, but nobody in that band has ever been on a Climax record. I'm like, I apologize. You're right. 
it's just, it's like degrading the legacy. And I, I just, it's ridiculous. But five of us are really cool and talking all the time. And we're like, we might actually do a record like all of us, except for Cooley, who just keeps trying to steal from the rest of us. I don't get it. But we're not laying down for that either. Uh, unfortunately, your story is not unusual uh, out there, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you know. There's so many, mm -hmm. uh, especially R&B bands, you know, that are splintered and uh, acrimony, yeah. you know, taking place. Especially Solar bands, Lakeside, Shalimar. It's like, then there's In Vogue. And I worked, actually, I was working with uh, Maxine and Dawn for a while. And I feel responsible for them. And it's not my fault, but I feel responsible for something. We were considering doing some touring together. Um, like, I think it was Funky Divas 2020. And I was doing these posts, like, we're going to do this work together. And so I think V103 in Chicago uh, put out a post about, the, yeah, the people want this. Like, you know, uh, the Funky Divas and Climax. I'm like, and we are divas. Divas, we love to. Funky Divas, all that. And so then the other ladies decided because they already took the in vogue name then they decided to copyright funky divas and let them know that they didn't want them to do that either and i just felt like even though at one point they were like just let them have it joyce we don't care just let them they could just have it all because it seems like it's that important but i felt responsible for you know, talking about it. I was excited about the idea. And I don't, I still, I don't understand that. I don't understand for all of the groups, not them, it's, it's for all of us to like try to slit the throats of your brothers or sisters that you are in the trenches with. Everybody has equity in these names. Why does one person feel like they can go in and gut everybody and then live off the benefits of a legacy that was collectively created. That just burns me up. I don't, I don't like that. Um, at one point within Climax, we had, we all had an agreement. Anybody could go out as Climax featuring Cheryl Cooley, featuring Bernadette Cooper, featuring Joyce Irby, Lynn Malsby, Lorena, Robin, but there's 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 that one, there's that one who's like, no, I just need it all for myself. We're like, okay, well, we're we're gonna put a stop to that. But anyway, sorry for going off on that tangent. It's it's very personal and it's just it's like we're demeaning ourselves with this crap. Well, it's aggravating, um, no doubt. And it's also misleading for fans and disappointing yes. for fans and um, That's fraud. you know, um, you know, there's cameo, the band war. Uh, for a long time it's been oh that's uh, right we did a sh yeah uh, i forgot about the war thing yeah and i think that's maybe actually keeping them from the uh, rock and roll hall of fame the way they have that divide you know um no it's a mm -hmm. shame but so glad to hear that the five of you at least are you know good and uh, maybe we'll get some music that'd be phenomenal yep Yep, um, I, I think you will we're on our group texts and group emails and it's, uh, it's 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 just really cool just you know all talking together and stuff because we're you know we're like sisters from a screwed up family but you're still family even if it's screwed up so it's nice to be able to you know have conversations where we have some type of common goal and everybody's cool with each other that's cool yeah <laughs> very cool appreciate you sharing that too joyce um what are one or two of the most unforgettable experiences that you had out there on the road with climax back in the 80s Oh, a lot of them I just can't really talk about, but I'll just say that. Um, for me personally, I can only speak for myself. I learned that um, you don't have to buy drugs. People give them to you for free. It's one of the perks, quote unquote, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then at some point you have like we i had so much fun i think i had a two and a half year run 
you know, it could be delivered or whatever. It didn't matter. It was all great. But then I was like, my body's like, okay, your heart's going to explode if you don't stop doing this. And I was able to stop. Um, all I did was, you know, I did cocaine. Um, and I was lucky that before, I guess, it turned into the stuff that they do now. And um, I never was much of a drinker. But the first, I was in a studio and the first time, like I don't smoke cigarettes either. It's so weird. But somebody emptied out a cigarette and they put some coke in a cigarette with a little tobacco. Here, just try this. I was like, oh, I hate that. I hate that. But the third time I tried it, all of a sudden, I was like, hey, I felt like my head was floating. I was like, oh, yes, I am the king of the world. And then after a while, I was just back on the ground like, oh, OK, that that's it. That was fun, but I don't want to do that all the time. So, um, yeah, and it's unfortunate that that's where I go to when you mention that. But people are sometimes they don't want to talk about stuff like that. I did it. I survived it. I'm glad I stopped it because it makes absolutely no sense. I had fun, but I was like, no. Mm -hmm. um just probably the best thing is not like some big individual thing like when we're all on stage together and we're playing and we're like vibing and the music is flowing and somebody thinks of some extra little thing like Lynn might put in a little piece of a solo that she hadn't done before or I might put in a couple of bass pops and then all of a sudden we do a breakdown we hadn't rehearsed and then Bernadette's running all over the stage knocking stuff down and flapping her arms and the people are just really, really into it. It's like, those are just like the best feelings because it's like a it's an energy exchange on stage and then it's like a love exchange with the audience. And that is priceless. It's priceless no matter if it's 10,000 people or 10 people. I mean, it makes a difference in how it feels, but the essence of the feeling individually is the same. And, you know, I, I'm just grateful. So grateful. Yeah. And people still want to hear these songs. I love it. Yeah. That's kind of what you're speaking to. It's just that spirit that's tapping back into what you're talking about at the beginning with like experiencing those George Clinton shows, you know, just... Yes. Yes. Kind of like the spirituality of, of the music and, and taking you over of the of the players on stage and the audience vibing with it. That's the ultimate. Yes. Yeah. What is your favorite um climax? I mean, is the the big one your favorite climax album? Yeah, the Meeting in the Ladies Room album. The one that just the one that opened the door for us. You know, it opened the door and Mr. Griffey allowed, you know, trusted me to do some music and trusted Byrne to come up with a way to dress it up and then trusted all of us to pretty much work through our own music after a while. And that's kind of rare, especially being female. That's still that's that was rare back then. Now everybody's doing it, but it was not like that. It was not like that at all. So, yeah. Do you feel like um, there's one or two songs in the catalog that didn't get over like maybe they could have and you think people maybe should give them another listen? Oh, yeah. Convince Me, which is a song on our second album that Lynn did. Convince Me for sure. And um, Ern had this crazy song called Multipurpose Girl that was should have been on the second album. I don't think it's on. It's not on any album. Uh, so that's not helpful. Some people have it online uh, somewhere, but yeah. But Convince Me definitely is a song that I just might think about re-recording. So people, it could be new and people can hear it. That was a really, really, really good song. Yeah, and that wasn't even a single, right? Mm -mm, nope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, multi purpose girl. That's a really fast, so funky dance track, yeah. Mm-hmm. And silly. <laughs> As you look back, uh, to close this up, Joyce, um, what accomplishment would you say you're most proud of just overall? Surviving. 
and being like, oh, and, you know, still finding great moments of joy in the simplest things. You know, I mean, I'm proud of finally writing a hit record, being able to sing on a hit record, meeting a billion people I never thought I would meet. Um, you know, I'm proud of the other people I facilitated. And um, I'm doing some music with my girls, like when we perform as Joyce Irby and Climax. There's some ladies I've been with for like over 10 years. And I'm beginning to record some stuff under the name of the Femme Mafia. Because we're not going to do music as Climax because we're not Climax. Even though when we do a show, I sing Climax songs. So it can be Joyce Irby and Climax. But now I add usually featuring the Femme Mafia because we're doing some fun stuff that's really cool that I hope people will be open to. And um, sort of like George with Parliament and Funkadelic or whatever. But yeah, I'm really proud of that, that nobody's heard yet. So I should start releasing music that's been, <laughs> that's been finished for a while. But I, mostly, Scott, I'm happy to be here. Well, now, of course, when people see this, they're going to demand that music. Um, well, we yeah, we got one thing that I just put up on, you know, that put out under the Femme Mafia to hold the name with the aggregators, or like on the sites. So there's one song, there's a video done. I just need to release it to promote it to people because I haven't mentioned it, but thank you for that. What's the best way people can keep track with what you're up to? Well, um, on IG, my name is at Joyce Irby, J-O-Y-C-E-I-R-B-Y. And I have my little link tree on there, which goes to everything else. Um, but if you love music, consider adding me to the list of people that you maybe follow on a streaming site, because I'm going to be consistent now with the stuff coming all the time. And if nobody ever sees me, I'm OK with it. But if nobody ever hears me, ah, I can't deal with that. So that's what I would love to be heard. Fantastic. We love hearing it. And, uh, you know, on behalf of everybody, Joyce, thank you so much for all the music through the years. You brought so much joy to our lives, so thank you. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. And thank you for staying on me about, hey, can you stop by my show? So, yes, I'm glad we did this. All right. See, I told you it'd be painless. <laughs> Very painless. Thank you, Scott. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net, and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one. We'll